Hello and welcome to today's internal medicine webinar. My name is Lydia Morgan and I'm commercial manager here at Virtual Veterinary Specialists. I'll be introducing our speaker for today, Dr. Jessica Adamany, with her brilliant webinar on transfusion medicine for the anemic cat, a topic which I'm very much looking forward to learning more about. VVS have a team of friendly and knowledgeable veterinary specialists who can support you with advice calls, written reports, radiology requests, or with our HALO service, our live guided specialist consultations. These include specialist live guided cardiology workups and live guided abdominal ultrasound with internal medicine review. Our internal medicine advice calls and written reports can be accessed by any veterinary team. There's no need to register or subscribe, so you can, you can keep your cases in-house by bringing VVS in. For those of you attending London Vet Show this year, we encourage you to visit us at stand P45. We'll be joined by De Dr. Jessica Adamany on the Friday, as well as other members of the VVS specialist team. This is a great opportunity to speak with them in person. With cake and coffee available for those in need of refreshment, other members of the VVS team, such as myself, are also on hand. We welcome any questions you might have regarding the VVS service and look forward to exploring how we can help you to offer a specialist service to your patients in-house. We really look forward to speaking with you, with you there. It's now my pleasure to introduce Dr. Jessica Adamany, European Specialist in Small Animal Internal Medicine. In 2013, Jessica undertook a residency in internal medicine at Pride Veterinary Centre, becoming a European diplomat in internal medicine in 2017. She's remained at Pride as Senior Medicine Clinician, Co-Director of the Rotating Internship Programme and Resident Supervisor. Jessica enjoys most aspects of internal medicine, but particularly enjoys gastroenterology and haematology. She's also passionate about teaching, and we're so lucky to have her on the VVS team, bringing her dedication and knowledge, as well as her compassion and understanding. If you have any questions as we go through the webinar, please add them to the chat box, and we'll finish up the presentation with a question and answer session at the end. So with that, I hand over to Jessica for today's talk. Thank you, Jess. Hello, everyone. Thank you for joining me today. Um, let's see if I can get to the first slide. So I appreciate you guys joining me today for this lecture. Um, it's one of four that I'll be doing over the next four weeks. Uh, today, I would like to speak to you about transfusion medicine and mainly focus on the anemic cat. So first, I'd like to review anemia um, and transfusion triggers, and then we'll more focus on things that we need to do before giving a transfusion, how to collect blood, and also provide the blood to the patient. So this is likely a review for everyone, but what is anemia? Anemia is a reduction in red cell mass, and it is also char often characterized on our hematology by either a low PCV or hemoglobin, hematocrit. Um, or a low red blood cell count, okay? So this is subsequently results in decreased oxygen carrying capacity to our patients and their organs. We know based on a very long equation that the oxygen carrying capacity in the arterial blood mainly relies on uh, the hemoglobin concentration. So just giving these patients flow by oxygen is not going to be enough. In the past, there was a product known as uh, oxyglobin, which I think was made by DECRA, uh, and this product was exactly what we needed when we didn't have the ability to give them red blood cells. And it was a artificial hemoglobin that you could provide. I think it was licensed for the dogs, but you could also provide it to cats, um, especially in the short term when we couldn't find blood for these patients. So what's most important is that we understand what is normal. So normal for the feline cat, the hematocrit or PCV is going to be around 27 to 50%. I believe that we should also kind of have in the back of our mind what a normal reticulocyte count is to know if our patient is regenerative or not. Um, and also that the degree of regeneration is really going to depend on the severity of the anemia. So when it's less than 50, we know it's really negligible. There's not much regeneration going on. Between 50 and 100, it's pretty mild. 100 to 200, we have moderate regeneration. So that cat's really trying hard to regenerate those red blood cells. And over 200, it's really considered marked regeneration. Now, when we interpret these results, it's very important that we think about that individual animal, including their signalment. Of course, that is something that is more important in our canine patients where there is more variation, especially with the sight hounds. So knowing that a sight hound's hematocrit should be closer to 60. So if they come in with a hematocrit of, of 30, that's a pretty severe anemia. Um, and also thinking about previous results that we've had. So I am, um, a, I have a, 
I think it's extremely important when we can to get baseline results on these patients. So although these animals come in for spays, neuters, and dentals, and they are healthy patients, and yes, at that time, they probably don't need a full hematology and biochemistry to ensure that they are healthy candidates for anesthesia, but having an idea of what their baseline results are for when they come in unwell can be extremely helpful, uh, especially when they come in with their anemic versus if they have li liver disease or liver enzyme elevation, you know, it's nice to be able to tell how long that's been going on for uh, and what the degree has been. So mechanisms for our, uh, for anemia. So there's three main mechanisms. Again, this is likely review for everyone. Um, so we have hemorrhage, which can be internal, or external based on where it is, and it can be local or systemic. We also have hemolysis, which is either immune mediated or non immune mediated, and then decreased erythropoiesis, which can be primarily from the, the bone marrow, but also can be external diseases that then affect the bone marrow, okay? In cats, it's reported that only five to 25% of them actually suffer from hemolysis in terms of causes of anemia. So more commonly, uh, at least in general practice, we see, or you see decreased erythropoiesis or decreased production or hemorrhage. However, I would say on the referral side, we do see quite a few cats that do have um, hemolysis. So what investigations can you do when these patients present to you? So it's extremely important, of course, to have, you know, a PCV, so we know if the patient's anemic or not. Um, but having a full hematology is extremely helpful and important. Mainly we're looking at, yes, that red cell count, but are they regenerative or not? We know that more often the regenerative types are the hemolysis uh, and hemorrhage. And, you know, thinking about could this be a pre-regenerative or are they truly regenerative or non-regenerative to helping us um, pinpoint kind of what our differentials for, or narrow down our differentials for this patient. It also allows us to look at the red cell indices. So is it microcytic? Is it hypochromic? So does it look like it's an iron deficient anemia? Are the red cells actually big? Is it because there is agglutination going on or is there some regeneration? Do these patients have, um, does this patient have a thrombocytopenia? Now, remember in cats, when we take their blood, often their platelets, they clump. So even if it says that there's a thrombocytopenia on the hematology, a blood smear analysis and manual count is going to be extremely important. I think every patient with anemia should have a blood smear analysis. It is a step that we need to take in all of our anemic patients. Looking for agglutination, you're looking for other causes of, of hemolysis that are non-immune needed, such as Heinz bodies. Looking for parasites, doing a manual platelet count and looking for atypical cells. Serum biochemistry, so it's great to look and assess other organ function, but we could also look and see if the urea is elevated, if we have a patient and they're anemic and we don't know why. Um, sometimes seeing that urea being elevated can be helpful to say, well, maybe there is some gastrointestinal blood loss that's going on that we can't detect because it's not coming out externally yet. And then looking for other causes of thrombocytopathia. So we do know that it can happen with severe azotemia or in animals that have plasma cell tumors, having the globulins being extremely elevated can result in bleeding from a thrombocytopathia. Coagulation testing can be helpful to see, you know, are they bleeding because of a coagulopathy? Are they in DIC? Your analysis is also part of the minimum database and also looking forward to see if there is hemoglobinuria, bilirubinuria, hematuria. Um, you can send away for a Coombs test. So a Coombs test is extremely important in our patients that we suspect could be having IMHA. We know that, you know, I prefer to, if I can, take blood for hematology, blood smear, serum biochemistry, and a Coombs test prior to transfusion. But there are reports in dogs showing that you can, well, the Coombs test is still reliable in patients that have already had actually a few weeks of immunosuppression um, medication or also after a transfusion. So it is not something that we need to get always right away, but it is best within that first period. And then these patients often require diagnostic imaging to either look for a cause of, of bleeding or decreased production, but as well as to see if their immune mediated hemolytic anemia, if that's present, is it primary or non-associative or associative? And then in some patients, we might require infectious disease testing that depends on where you live. I would say very often in this country, it's not something that we that we really um, use as much as where I'm from, so the United States. 
Um, but with our mycoplasma, so the hematrophic mycoplasmas, we do check for those in the cats and dogs. In patients, we might need to consider an iron panel. So if you have a patient that is bleeding, that is um, not regenerating, or there is evidence of microcytic hyperchromic anemia, it's something that can be useful. And then last but not least, some of these patients um, will require bone marrow cytology and biopsy. So I'd like to go through the coping mechanisms that our patients have, our humans and our small patients, when they're becoming anemic. And these are the coping mechanisms um, to allow them to increase oxygen um, perfusion to their organs, okay? So the first thing that will happen is that they'll have an increased cardiac output. So the sympathetic nervous system is going to be triggered in these patients and their heart rate is going to increase. So they will have an increased um, cardiac output as well. We also have increased erythropoiesis. So the kidney will detect that there is an anemia and send erythropoietin to the bone marrow and then the bone marrow will increase uh, red cell production. However, we do know that this can take around three to five days to start. So it is kind of a delayed effect. In patients, we can also have a splenic contraction. It is something that we speak about more often in dogs versus in cats, but it is something that we can see. Um, and then also, I'm sure you everyone remembers this from vet school. So it is the oxygen, oxygen hemoglobin associ dissociation curve. So we know that when you are anemic, you have a shift to the right uh, of, the, of the curve, which then results in decreased binding affinity for hemoglobin to the oxygen and therefore more offloading to the tissues. We will also have redistribution of blood to the vital organs. And then we can also activate our RAS system and vasopressin to get fluid content back into the vasculature. So what clinical signs can we see in our patients? So as I mentioned previously, the sympathetic nervous system is often triggered in these patients. So we will see most often a tachycardia. However, um, in, in cats, we can also see a bradycardia. These patients often will have a heart murmur, um, and this will be because of decreased viscosity of the blood. So there is more turbulence and therefore we have a heart murmur. Patients can have tachypnea, of course, their gums are going to be pale. They can have a prolonged capillary refill time. They, they can have bounding pulses or weak pulses. It depends on the type of anemia that you have. Um, you will have more often weak pulses in cases of hemorrhage. And then these patients may come in weak or with weakness, lethargic, they might be collapsed. However, you can have patients where the anemia has been going on chronically and they don't present with any of these signs. They present completely stable. And I'm extremely surprised by how many times we can see cats coming in with their chronic anemias, often from a decreased production. And these cats have hematocrits of 10, 12, and they are as fractious as if they had a hematocrit of 35, okay? So now let's get on to about the actual transfusions and you know, does my patient, should be the biggest question is, does my patient need a blood transfusion? And so a transfusion is required when the hemoglobin level drops too low for adequate tissue oxygenation and therefore anaerobic metabolism occurs. In humans and our dogs and in our cats, there is no specific PCV trigger to say, this is the point at which my patient needs a transfusion. I would say even in my chronic anemic patients, um, most of them start to decompensate around 10 to 15%. So usually I would say the majority of them need a transfusion at that point, but that's not, that's not always true, okay? Um, and so we really need to look at the entire clinical picture. So looking at the laboratory work, the degree of the anemia, as I just said, and thinking about how, or knowing how chronic it's been going on. So again, these patients where it's been going on more chronically, they're able to enlist more of those coping mechanisms. Um, and therefore not all of them need a transfusion immediately. We also need to think about the cause of the anemia and ongoing losses. So, you know, even if your patient's not showing that they need a transfusion right now, if those ongoing losses are severe, you need to be ready in the fact that they might need a transfusion soon. And then really paying attention to our physical exam and looking at our patient, okay? So it's not the number, it is the patient. Um, and occasionally, you know, you have patients that are having, especially in a dog, a hemoabdomen, and their hematocrit isn't dropping, you know, it's dropping 
fast, um, and even if you check their red blood cell count, it's going to look like it's the, the same. Um, but actually, these patients clinically, they need um, a transfusion sooner rather than later because they are acutely bleeding versus that chronic anemic patient, let's say with a non-regenerative anemia due to bone marrow disease, they can really drop their uh, red blood cell count very low, but continue to cope. Okay, so I like to look at my patients and yes, be able to try to figure out what is the cause of their anemia, but also does my patient need a transfusion now? Or can my patient wait while I'm trying to do my investigations? So let's look at two cases just to kind of bring this point home. So this is a seven-year-old, th three-month uh, feline neuter domestic short hair. Uh, the cat presents to you for anemia. It is quiet, alert, and responsive, probably not as quiet as in the picture. Um, the heart rate's around 120 with a two out of six systolic heart murmur. The respiratory rate is 46, and this patient's well hydrated. Um, so based on your hematology, this patient's hematocrit is 12%, so very low. Um, and the patient, if you look at the reticulocyte count, 40.32, so this patient is not regenerating, okay? And so looking at the fact that the patient's not regenerating, the hematocrit is very low, and the patient is otherwise well hydrated and has an extremely fast heart rate, is tachypnic, and is extremely lethargic um, or quiet, this patient would require a blood transfusion. Conversely, we can look at this patient who was a two year, eight month old male neutered domestic long hair. This cat presents to you with also a very severe anemia. Um, I think the PCV was around 15%, yeah, the hematocrit says 13.9. Um, and you can see this cat is having marked severe regeneration, so at 218. On the blood smear, you can see this patient actually had Heinz bodies. It's not with the right stain, but you can actually see where the errors are. There are Heinz bodies. And this patient presents relatively stable, a heart rate of 160 with a respiratory rate of 36. Um, this patient, uh, we elected not to transfuse initially due to the fact that transfusions, they do, they can have complications. You can have transfusion reactions. Feline blood is precious. And this cat at that moment was not showing that it needed a transfusion. Now, we didn't quite know in which direction this cat would go. So we continued to monitor this patient. And due to its severe regeneration and the removal of the cause of the Heinz body anemia, this patient actually didn't require a blood transfusion. So let's speak about feline blood groups. So cats have, cats just like dogs and people have antigenic markers. So alloantigens on their red blood cells, which determine their blood group. This is most extensively, the most extensively studied blood group in cats is the AB system. So we know that the A blood type is more common than the B blood type, and, there, and that is more common than the AB blood type. There are lots of studies on the AB system and looking at geographically um, which cats are more likely to be type A, type B, and type AB. Um, so here, are just a, a nice chart showing you, based on three studies, kind of what breeds are more likely to be type A versus type B. So when I'm looking for a type B cat for blood transfusion, I often am looking for the British short hair because you can see about 60% of them are type B, okay? Whereas in this country, uh, the Bengals and the Siamese were often there, well, in, this, in these smaller studies, 100% of them were actually type A. So unlike in dogs, cats also possess, possess al al alloantibodies to the foreign or absent red blood cell alloantigens. And these can elicit actually a very fatal reaction if, it's, if a cat is transfused with the wrong blood. So in the UK, we know that 70% of type A cats have anti-B antibodies at a, a rather low concentration. 100% of type B cats have anti-A alloantibodies at high concentrations. And interestingly, the AB cats, they don't have alloantibodies. The severity of the transfusion reaction that can occur depends on the quantity and the nature of these alloantibodies. So when do we blood type? So unlike in dogs, there is no universal blood donor in cats. So it is mandatory to know the recipient and donor blood type prior to transfusion to prevent a fatal reaction. Okay, so it's extremely important and every patient needs to be performed. Um, what a lot of the blood banks recommend, or if you're making a donor list, if you have a cat that shows up to be type B or type AB, 
while in-house uh, blood typing, it's best to have those checked externally to ensure that they're that they are correct. Um, and this is just a nice diagram to keep in mind when you are giving blood transfusions. So A cats should receive A blood, B cats should receive B blood, AB cats should receive AB blood. Um, but if AB blood is not available, which it will rarely be available, they can receive A blood or ideally the red blood cells only. So how do I, how do you guys blood type or how do we blood type? So right now there's only blood typing methods for the AB blood group. There are quite a few different methods um, or brands out there that are selling kits for blood typing. So the one that you can see at the top right, this is the Rapid Vet H card. It is based on agglutination. So although it's been shown to be relatively reliable in the patient that is having agglutination, it, it won't be reliable unless you're able to wash the cells. And therefore, although it was um, the method that we used at my practice many years ago, we've now moved to the quick test, AB. So this test, as well as Rapid Vet H, also makes uh, a similar test. So it's immunochromatographic. Um, and so these tests have been shown to be rather reliable and um, especially, most importantly, reliable in cases that are having agglutination, okay? If you have a very anemic patient, so often with a PCV less than 14, less than 10, uh, to get a reliable result, it may be necessary to centrifuge the blood for about two to three minutes to remove a little bit of the plasma that's there, resuspend the cells so it's more concentrated, and then retest the patient so we can make sure that our, our result is reliable. But what about non-AB blood groups? So more recently, um, other blood groups apart from the, or aside from the AB blood group that is extensively studied have been identified. So in 2007 in Pennsylvania, University of Pennsylvania, um, it was detected that there was an absence of a non-AB antigen, which is now called the MYC antigen, that was identified in three out of 36 type A cats. Um, MYC negative cats, so there are very few of them, MYC negative cats actually have naturally occurring alloantibodies that are capable of causing a transfusion reaction if that blood is donated to a MYC, uh, MYC positive or a cat with the MYC gene. Now, prior studies from quite a few years ago um, in the UK and in Germany did not detect any incompatibilities when cats were appropriately AB matched. However, uh, there is a 2000, I think it's 22 or 23 paper from the RBC looking at transfusion naive cats and showing that quite a few of them had preformed non AB antibodies. So some of them had antibodies that then could result in a transfusion reaction and therefore we couldn't detect it by just blood typing these cats. In addition, out of the United States, there is another study showing that there probably are around four other feline antigens that we might need to start thinking about and being worried about. And unfortunately, aside from the AB blood types, uh, we are unable to blood type for this MYC antigen or any of the other potentially uh, identified feline erythrocyte antigens. So what about cross-matching? So this is the cross-match kit that we use. Um, it is an important test that tests for serological compatibility or incompatibility incompat between the donor and the recipient. So the most important is the major cross match. So this is where we can assess compatibility of the donor red cells to the recipient plasma or serum. And the minor cross match is the other way around, okay? So currently most important is that major cross match because we are giving the red cells from the recipient to the donor, but the minor cross match is something that can be important and helpful if you're giving type A blood to an AB cat or when they're having a multiple transfusions. Now this test, uh, the rapid vet H test can take at least 20 minutes. So if you're in an emergency situation and you need a rapid way to try to cross match your patients, what we can do or what you can do is take one drop of donor blood with EDTA and mix it with one drop of the recipient serum and two drops of saline. And you can kind of swirl it around on a slide and then look at it within one minute, look at it microscopically and macroscopically to see if there's agglutination. Uh, if you wait more than one minute, then the blood starts to dry and then it will look like they're agglutinating anyway. 
So when do we cross match our patients? So we should cross match them when you have a patient arrive and you don't know their transfusion history. So if it's a cat that's coming from, it's had previous owners in the past and you don't have their history um, or a cat that's come in that's been hit by a car without the owner, okay? So if you don't know the transfusion history, we should be cross matching these patients. If they've had a prior transfusion reaction, and also if they've had a transfusion within two or more days. So previously we would say about three to four days, but there have been studies more recently showing that uh, cats can form antibodies to blood that they had just received in about two days. So we should change that rule to cross matching them two days after a trans their first transfusion. But now the, a big area of controversy controversy is what about our transfusion naive cats? Okay, so this is controversial and maybe it is based on you know, your ge geographical location. Uh, so I, as I mentioned previously, there are um, other blood groups besides the, the AB blood group that we are aware of and that we can uh, type for. So what about, so there have been new, numerous studies that have documented these non-AB compatibilities on major cross-match. So meaning that there are other, an, uh, other antigens and other antibodies that we can't detect, okay? So it's been up to about 27% of cases will, when you do a cross-match, will have some incompatibility. But actually four, only 4% 4 of them had significant incompatibilities. And most of these studies are coming from North America. However, as I mentioned in a few slides previously, the RVC has showed that uh, they have actually had some cats where they do have incompatibility. So they are matched based on the AB group system, but even on their first transfusion, when they have cross-matched them, there have been incompatibilities. So um, a lot of these cats, based on that study, they did have Feet more often had a febrile reaction, which is interesting because usually those febrile reactions are due to the white blood cells being a problem rather than um, actual other allo antibodies. But some of them did have these acute hemolytic reactions, so they are possible. However, these large studies also show that despite having some hemolytic transfusion reactions, they didn't increase the mortality, nor did they decrease the PCV. So the question is, if it's not really affecting the patient's outcome, is it worthwhile doing this extra test? That costs money and that takes time. And I think personally, I think we need to take a pragmatic kind of approach to it. We know that the, there are these non-AB um, antigens and therefore allo antibodies. At least in the States, they've been shown that some of them, especially the MIT, can cause um, severe transfusion reactions. And therefore, if we have the blood available and if we can, Cross match our patient and have the time to do so in this naive transfusion patient, I think we should do it. Um, but if we don't, if it is their first transfusion and we don't have the time or we don't have five bags of blood to cross match, give the blood. And yes, there might be a transfusion reaction, but at the moment, it seems that the risk of that um, and the increased mor mor morbidity and mortality is, is not much higher. Okay. I hope that makes sense. Um, so donor selection. So in this country, we have access to um, canine blood bank. And previously at my practice, we actually were importing feline blood from a blood bank in Portugal, but now because of Brexit, we don't have that ability. And so it's, I find that it should be, it is extremely important that where I work as a referral hospital, that we do have a blood donor list, but it's something that I think that we should also have within our first opinion practices, okay? So here are some, we're gonna go through the criteria on, or at least the best criteria for donor selection. Um, and then we'll speak about collecting the blood and donating blood, okay? So the ideal donor is going to depend on your location, really. So ideally the patient will be one to eight years of age. They'll have a lean body mass of at least 4.5 kilograms. We want them up to date on their vaccinations, their worming and their ectoparasites, ideally indoor only. So once you've checked them for these diseases um, and infectious diseases that can be transmitted via blood, that then you don't have to keep rechecking re them every few months or every year or before they transfuse. So ideally indoor only, um, not on any medications, no travel history or new cats, 
uh, again, due to not having to test them all the time for infectious diseases, no prior transfusion history. And then ideally you will have a hematology, serobiochemistry, at least yearly in your blood donor list, or, or if you're getting a cat in that's on an old list, um, I would I always check the hematology, serum, biochemistry, and the feline leukemia, feline AIDS status prior to transfusion. Um, when they come in for donation, they have to have a PCV that's greater than 35%. In this country, it would also be useful, especially if you have a donor selection list, to check your patients for um, hemotropic mycoplasma, mainly the hemophilus, as well as Bartonella. So you want them to be, to be negative. Um, again, this is something where you probably check them initially. And as long as they're indoor only, it's rare that you would need to check them again. But also we have a, a donor list at my practice and uh, these are not checked before every transfusion. Most often, we are getting them in because we need blood immediately rather than having a blood bank. And therefore we don't have the time to wait for these PCR tests to come back. So usually these patients are checked initially. And then prior to transfusion, I run a hematology biochemistry and we do an FELV antigen and FIV antibody SNAP test. So blood collection, um, it's rather easy. And so I don't want you to be frightened about the, the procedure. Um, or deterred by what we discuss. So there's two different methods in terms of collection systems. There's an open system and a closed system. I find that open system is much easier in our feline patients, um, but the, the open system means that there are many areas or open areas to have contamination. Whereas with the closed system, it's actually the bag and it has only one point of possible contamination, and that is where you, you stick the, the patient to get the blood, okay? Um, we're going to speak about the open system because it seems to be the most common system um, that we use in cats, but also there have been studies looking at the difference between the open and closed system and looking at contamination and risk of bacterial infection or contamination um, with storage, and actually there hasn't been a big difference between um, bacterial infection within, within both of them. Yes, they're using technicians, uh, nurses, staff that are well-trained in collecting the samples. Um, so maybe that's part of the reason, but I think the more that we do it, um, the more practice we get and the better we get. So an open system with a, a lot of practice should be just as sufficient as a closed system. So the first thing that we should do when we get our patient in we should do a physical examination on them to make sure that they are healthy. Uh, we don't hear a heart murmur. They've had um, no prior illnesses and not on any medications. And we should check their PCV. And at least um, it should be at least around 35% or above. Ideally, these patients should be sedated. Um, we do have lots of cats that are very amendable to blood draws. However, the more that we use them, um, the less amendable they become. There are, we want to pick a sedation protocol that is injectable, that is fast, has minimal cardiorespiratory uh, depression, and they can have a fast recovery for, okay? Um, we know that not only is the stress something that is harmful to the patient, we don't want our patients when they're coming in for donation to be stressed, and neither do their owners, um, but also we know that it does have some negative effects on the red blood cells as well. We want to have multiple syringes filled with anticoagulant. So there's lots of different types of anticoagulant that we can use. Um, and we need to use about one mil of the anticoagulant to seven mils of blood. So the donor should be restrained in the preferred position for the technician or the nurse, the vet that's going to be doing the blood draw. Hair over the jugular should be clipped and aseptically cleaned. Obviously pressure is applied to the thoracic inlet to raise the jugular. And then we use a butterfly catheter to collect the blood. While the blood is being drawn, um, the assistant should be rotating and rocking the syringe to help mix it with the anticoagulant. And then afterwards, pressure is applied to the jugular. Um, and then at my practice and at many practices, often we provide crystalloid fluids afterwards. There are some practices that don't and studies have shown that it wasn't harmful to the patient. Um, however, if you imagine if you're taking quite a bit of blood from the patient, um, 
refilling their intravascular volume will be helpful for them. So often after the procedure, we provide two to three times the volume of IV crystalloid fluids. If you have a question regarding the, the picture on the right, um, often where I work uh, and when I'm doing it, I do wear sterile gloves. However, in lots of the reviews, the consensus statements, the emergency and critical care books, uh, they recommend that you wear clean gloves, but they don't speak about aseptic um, technique using gloves, as, uh, using sterile gloves as well. But in my opinion, the least risk we have um, to have bacterial contamination, the better. Now there's the, this, this paper should be available to everyone. You should have access to it. If you don't, please contact us um, and I'm happy to get it and have it shared with you. So um, the ISFM have made a very large um, guidelines on a lot of the things I'm going through now, but blood grouping, um, cross-matching, blood collection, best practices for donors. Um, and also on there, they give lots of different sedation protocols that you can use. So this is a, a great review paper to go through a lot of the information that I'm going through and have printed out maybe the sedation protocols, the techniques. Um, so it is very helpful. And I would recommend that you uh, have access to it. So how much blood can I take from my donor? So the blood volume of a cat is around 50 to 60 mils per kilo, and we can take up to, safely, up to 20% of the blood volume every four weeks. Now, the majority of the uh, blood banks will only use their cats every eight to 12 weeks, because if you're using them more frequently, you have to be supplementing them with iron, um, but you could do it up to every four weeks. It's recommended that we take... 10 to 12 mils per kilo, so that's about average, which is 40 to 60 mils per cat. Now, so how much do you need? How much does this patient, my patient that is anemic, how much blood do I need to give them to make them stable? So we need to consider the cause of the anemia. Are there ongoing losses? What's the degree of regeneration? There are quite a few equations that we can use to try to predict uh, how much blood we need to give or what our PCV will be after donation. Um, and these are two frequent trans um, equations that, that I use. So just mainly here for your reference. So let's speak about blood administration. So what you want to do, so if you have the blood that's been in the refrigerator, what you want to do is to warm it to room temperature or to body temperature, so around 37 degrees using a warm water bath. So you don't want the water to be get more than 37 degrees because it can be harmful to the red cells. So you wanna make sure you have a thermometer in there. When I take blood from a cat and a lot of the clinicians uh, where I work, what we do is we take one syringe out at a time. So the remainder remain in the fridge and they can stay in the refrigerator for up to 24 hours. But once you've taken a, a syringe out of the refrigerator, that one needs to be used within four hours, okay? So aseptically attach a narrow giving set with a hemonate filter. So it's a microaggregate filter to try to prevent or remove any uh, microthrombi or aggregates of red blood cells. And you wanna put it as close to the patient as possible. So you can see in the picture to the right, uh, the hemonate filter is attached to the T-port. You wanna do a test dose of 0.5 mils per kilo per hour for about 15 minutes, and then you can increase it to one mil per kilo per hour for the next 15 minutes. And then often we increase it after that, as long as the patient has tolerated that starting dose, the slow starting dose, we increase it to make sure that the transfusion is given within, within four hours. Um, during this transfusion period, you don't wanna be moving the patient around the hospital, unattaching them, reattaching them, taking them to the toilet. Uh, it's ideal that they remain in place while having their transfusion. Um, in the majority of patients, if you can, it's better to place uh, a new IV. So, you know, the IV is in place and, and adequately flushed. You want to make sure it's flushed beforehand and afterwards with saline. Um, the reason for this is because we have citrate as the, anti as the anticoagulant, and that can chelate the calcium in Hartman's fluids, uh, resulting in thrombi formation. So you want to use saline. Also, you don't want to be giving these patients any fluids with dextrose because that can cause red blood cell clumping, swelling, and hemolysis. The PCV of the patient should be checked after the transfusion. We don't have studies in dogs at this. I'm sorry, in cats at this time, but in dogs there is a study showing that 
checking it between two and four hours didn't make a difference in what the PCV would be. Um, of course, it's a little bit counterintuitive because if the patient is actively bleeding, of course, there will be a significant drop. Um, but in the majority of patients, on average, it didn't make a difference between if you checked it right after transfusion or up to four hours. Usually I check it two to four hours after transfusion, and then I continue to monitor my patient. And, and importantly, again, speaking about baseline measurements, this is so I have a baseline to see how high did it go, because based on those calculations, and if you predict how high the PCV will get, or you have an idea of what you want it to be, often, although these equations are as accurate as they can be, um, it's rare when you reach your target perfectly. So it's great to have that baseline and then you'd be able to monitor your patient afterwards. You monitor them clinically for signs of needing another transfusion. And then you also can check another PCV when you think it's time and you have a comparison. And in addition, it's important that we monitor these patients uh, for the need of another transfusion and then the transfusion reactions. Now, what if you're a feline donor or what if a feline donor is not available? or you don't have one that is compatible. So xenotransfusions um, are something that we're using more and more, uh, especially when we don't have a feline blood bank and our donor cat list needs to be increased. Um, so what a xenotransfusion is, it's transfusion of blood from one species to another. And we know that due to the lack of alloantibodies in the dog blood, a transfusion um, or dog blood can be given to a cat without an immediate transfusion reaction, as you would see if you gave uh, a type B cat A blood, okay? Um, previously, doing xenotransfusions was frowned upon, but more and more we see that uh, it can safely be provided in these patients one time, okay? So what are our reasons to consider a xenotransfusion? We can consider it when there has been a prior transfusion reaction. If we have insufficient time to actually type that patient and give them appropriate typed blood. We have an unavailable suitable cat donor. So if you have a cat that's had a transfusion before and you're trying to cross match them and you cannot find uh, a patient that is cross match appropriate or for ethical reasons. So as I mentioned, we don't have this feline blood bank and we don't have lots of cat donors. So if I truly think that this patient is going to have, let's say cancer, um, do I wanna call in one of my few cat donors to give blood to this patient? Probably not. So this would be a patient where I either would hold off as long as I can to give a transfusion or consider giving dog blood um, that is more available. So what are the caveats to xenotransfusion? So, it is a short-term stabilization. These cats will make uh, antibodies to these red blood cells, and therefore the, the median survival time of the red the canine red cells is about two days. So it is a short-term stabilization. These patients often, um, so the recipient, the cat often will get a febrile non-hemolytic reaction and then a delayed hemolytic reaction. It's recommended to give the minimum dose needed to stabilize the patient, okay? And again, like I said, only can be used as a one-off if dog blood is given again, it can result in anaphylactic shock and death. So monitoring the transfusion patient. Uh, so the parameters that we want to consider, so you wanna have your baseline again, and then continually monitor their temperature, their pulse rate and quality, mucous membrane color and capillary refill time, respiratory rate, and pay attention to the effort, their blood pressure, as well as monitoring for any vomiting, any diarrhea, um, any redness or edema, puritis, and urine color, okay? So initially you wanna do this every five minutes for around the first 30 minutes, and then every 15 minutes up to that first hour. Following that, depending on what um, book or guidelines you read, they will say that it can then go to as long as the patient's been stable, every 30 minutes to an hour should be sufficient. That being said, that's checking those parameters and documenting them on a sheet. That's not walking away from the patient and then coming back at a half an hour, an hour, because transfusion reactions can occur during that time. So someone should still be sat there monitoring that patient visually during this time. And then the patient should also receive frequent checks up to 24 hours once the transfusion has been completed. So there's many different um, monitoring sheets that you'll find. The most important things are 
you kind of have written down the patient's baseline information. You have guidelines from yourself or another veterinarian in terms of what the checking the blood type of the patient, if the patient's been cross-matched, what you want your primary rate and secondary rate to be. Um, and then also having a sheet so you can track what their heart rate, respiratory rate does. So here's one example of one. Um, and then another example of another one. Okay, I prefer, I mean, this one seems more clear, but the other one, you know, you can actually visualize instead of writing down the numbers, actually see the trends because you're graphing it, uh, putting it on a graph. So lastly, I'd like to go through transfusion reactions. Um, so these are immunologic or non-immunologic. They are rare. It's about one to 9% of cases and it increases with repeated transfusions. And it is rarely due to blood group mismatches um, or storage, things like that. It's more often due to other blood components. Um, so we spoke about the red blood cells, the platelets, or abnormal collection, processing, storage, or the host mechanisms, okay? So as long as we're blood typing them, cross-matching if needed, sterile collection, appropriate storage and donation, hopefully we limit um, these transfusion reactions as much as possible. The, in JVEX, so it's the Journal of Emergency Critical Care, they have a three-part, um, very long consensus statements on transfusion reactions. So on the definitions of transfusion reactions, how to identify and monitor them, and then part three is on diagnosis and treatment. So I will speak about a few of the more common transfusion reactions, but this paper is also open access, so you should be able to access it. And it has really great flow charts on, you know, if my patient's temperature increases, what is my next step? Okay, if, if that happens, what is my next step? So it is something that would be great to especially read through, but also if you are keen to start doing um, lots of transfusions in practice, having them posted around the hospital um, or at least be able to put next to the patient when they're having a transfusion. So you really have a step-by-step -step guide on what, on what to do. So first I would like to speak about allergic transfusion reactions. This is up to 7% of dogs, 4% of cats, the type one hypersensitivity to an antigen within the blood. And usually it can happen during or within four hours of finishing the blood transfusion. Uh, in dogs, you'll have erythema, utricaria, pruritus, angioedema, and often gastrointestinal. So we know that they're kind of shock organs or skin in the gastrointestinal tract, whereas in cats, it's more respiratory. So you'll have some edema, you'll have bronchoconstriction, mucus production, uh, but maybe some of the first signs that we see is vocalization and can be drooling. So the things that you wanna do is you wanna stop the transfusion. You wanna assess the patient, making sure that they are otherwise clinically stable, making sure that they're not hemolyzing, their temperature is not very high, okay? So if they are not hemolyzing, if their vitals are stable, you can, we often, if it looks like an allergic reaction, administer an antihistamine or if they're vomiting, an antiemetic, and then we can often, often restart the blood transfusion. Now, based on the consensus guidelines I just spoke to you about, we don't really know if you can start it at the same rate or slower rate. We often start it at a slower rate and I don't see a, a problem with that. Again, as long as it's finished around that four hour mark. I didn't speak about anaphylactic shock as a transfusion reaction. Uh, it is something that you can see, but it is very rare. Uh, again, it's something where you stop the transfusion reaction. These patients often need treatment for anaphylaxis. Uh, so epinephrine, fluid therapy, monitoring blood pressure. Okay, so it is something that we do see, but it is rare. So what about the febrile non-hemolytic um, transfusion reactions. So these are the ones that are most common. And as I mentioned previously, it is often due to um, the white blood cells or platelets that are coming from the donor and being given to the recipient, to the patient. How you classify this is that the temperature is greater than 39 degrees and it's one, per, one degree increase from baseline. What we need to do here is again, stop the transfusion, assess the patient. What we mainly wanna look for is making sure this patient is not hemolyzing because if it is hemolyzing, that's when we stop the transfusion completely. But if there are no signs of hemolysis and the patient is hemodynamically stable, it is often something that we then can restart and monitor. 
sorry, going, I wanted to quickly, one thing I didn't comment on about this allergic transfusion reaction. So also based on the guidelines, there is no proof that giving them an antihistamine prior to transfusion uh, limits the likelihood of a allergic reaction uh, afterwards or during the during the transfusion. And therefore it's not recommended that you we, that we pretreat these patients, even if they've had a reaction previously. We don't that, that doesn't mean that they're going to have a reaction again. Um, so pretreating them is not necessary, but giving it during the transfusion, if you do see an allergic reaction, um, is necessary. Okay. So acute hemolytic transfusion reactions, this can occur during or within 24 hours. You'll have evidence of in, often intravascular hemolysis. So you'll have uh, hemoglobinemia, hemoglobinuria, and you might have some ghost cells. It can be immunologic, so due to blood type incompatibilities, um, or maybe you had a positive cross match, but also non-immunologic. So red blood cell damage via thermal, osmotic, mechanical or chemical factors. And here you need to stop the transfusion and provide supportive care. Um, we don't want this pigmenturia to be affecting the kidney. So often they're put on fluid therapy. And then if the patient does need a transfusion, um, you know, you, the next time you check the bag, you make sure the bag, the red cells look, look normal. There's no discoloration. You blood type them again, you cross match them if need be. So about delayed uh, hemolytic transfusion reactions. So this is something that we see within 24 hours to 28 days after transfusion. And it's kind of a, a sudden drop in the red blood cell count that was not expected. So again, it's due to delayed antibody formation to the donor's red blood cells. And it's something that we see always in our cats receiving xenotransfusion. <clears throat> so non-immunologic transfusion reactions. So these can happen with an infectious disease that's being transmitted or bacterial contamination. So these patients can have a fever. Um, you can have citrate toxicity. So there's lots of citrate in, in our blood bags or in the syringes, and it can lead to hypocalcemia. But this is often if they're having massive transfusions, so lots and lots of blood. And then we also can see circulatory overload. And this is one that I did want to speak about because I have seen it in a few dogs, um, but do see it rather frequently in our cats. So it is an acute reaction secondary to an increase in blood volume following blood transfusion. It occurs often during the transfusion or within six hours of finishing the transfusion. It is based on your clinical examination. So, you know, are they breathing faster? Are they tachypnic? Are they oxygen dependent? What does their echocardiogram show? Is there radiographic evidence of pulmonary edema or pleural effusion to indicate there is volume overload? It is common in patients that have pre-existing heart disease that you actually couldn't detect on your physical examination, which is often in cats. Um, they could have a hypovolemic anemia. So when they have IMHA or hemolysis, their blood volume or intravascular volume is still normal because um, they're not losing plasma and therefore we can overload them or we're giving them whole blood, okay? Um, but also can happen with very chronic and severe anemias. These patients often respond to diuretics or thoracocentesis thoracos if required. So in summary, I think it's important to remember that there is no PCV trigger for a transfusion. We need to look at our patient, not the number, and see if our patient needs a transfusion now or do we think they're about to decompensate? Can they get through our diagnostic investigation? Or do we need to give blood now before we can do some of our tests? Um, I would say a lot of the patients that are coming to our referral practice, and a lot of times when I'm giving transfusions, you know, before sedating for imaging or before having to perform, let's say, a bone marrow biopsy under anesthesia, I'm having to transfuse a lot of my patients. But for the initial investigations with blood work, blood smear analysis, um, physical examination, they don't often need a, a blood transfusion. So it's not just looking at your patient now, but thinking about how stable will they be if I'm moving them around the hospital or creating extra stress or having to put them under anesthesia. We always need to blood type our patient. There is no universal donor and cross-matching should be something that we, well, is what we need to do in patients. Um, two days or more after a transfusion, prior transfusion reactions or unknown transfusion history. And it might be something that we should consider in our patients that are naive um, to transfusions, okay? Based on the other blood types that we can't test for. 
It'd be great if we all can create a donor blood list and train our staff on best practices for the collection and administration of the blood products. Um, if a, a tight matched and cross matched patient is not a donor is not available, we should consider xenotransfusion. Yes, we know they're likely to have a delayed hemolytic reaction, uh, but it will stabilize our patient during the initial investigations or while we're trying to find a suitable donor. And then last, we, you know, train staff on how to monitor for and treat transfusion reactions and really check out um, that journal article that I posted. All right, I'm open for questions if anyone has them. Thank you so much, Jess. That was really brilliant. Yeah. Um, really great session. I'm glad you clarified about the antihist pre-treating with antihistamines because that was going to be one of my questions. We have got a few questions okay. in the uh, question and answer. One that I'm going to start with is if you do create like a donor list, do you generally put together resources for the owners so they are aware of what kind of what they're potentially signing their pet up for or um do, so is yes it more... yeah so you should also contact the the blood bank um because sometimes they also bring out staff to to help you it is something that so our nurses carry out a lot of um the education of the owners but it is something where usually on a weekend we have uh, kind of like an open day and they bring in their cats or dogs um for examinations with the vet blood typing, cross-matching, and also or blood typing, um, biochemistry, hematology, and having that discussion with the owners really about um, what it means to be a blood donor, one that we can call you in the middle of the night and might need you, mm. uh, and what kind of steps we take to collect that blood from the patient. And also making them confident that we want it to be as nice as a process as can be for the cat. And you know, that's why we do sedate them. We pick safe sedation. Um, we like to keep them in afterwards to monitor them. But also if your patient or if your animal eventually no longer likes coming in for these procedures, we don't want to continue to stress them. And so we remove them from the blood donor. Um, my cat was removed from the blood donor list. But yes, it's something where you need, the owners need to be fully aware of, you know, what they're signing up for. Um, but I would say the risks are low and the benefits are high. And often, at least where we are, we often also give them like, if they come in for blood donation, something nice for the cat to go home with, some food or a voucher to the little shop, something like that. Um, but really having your owners completely understand what it means to be a, a blood donor is extremely important because our cat will come out with a shaved neck and maybe with a bandage on their neck because you know we had a hard time getting the blood. Mm. Yeah, and I think it's such a great project for someone to take on in the clinic and really, you know, yeah. uh, the opportunity to have that education and speak to owners is, is fab. So we also have a question. So this is about transfusion reactions. Yeah. Uh, if you have a spike in temperature um, as you start transfusing, what action would you take? And if um, and if it's higher than what number, you know, when would, I suppose, when would you stop with what change in temperature would you would you stop? Yeah, so for me, if it goes above 40.5, I would probably stop. Um, often you should stop. You should look at the transfusion bag and make sure it doesn't look discolored. You should check and make sure that you've cross-matched um, or, or typed plus or minus cross-matched appropriately. Um, and then making sure they're not hemolyzing. If they're hemolyzing, you need to stop. Uh, or if they're becoming in respiratory distress, we need to stop. But yeah, usually for me, I... Often it seems that when you stop it for a little bit and reassess all that, and that's not happening, not, not, not ongoing, and then restart the transfusion, often it seems that things stabilize. Uh, but the other question is, is it due to the actual patient's underlying disease? Okay, so uh, if it was a dog, I might give um, paracetamol. Obviously, we're not going to be doing that to the cat. Uh, but I would say if it gets above 40.5, uh, I would stop the transfusion. Great, thank you. And then someone has asked, um, what about giving cats a xenotransfusion with human blood? Is that, has that yeah, ever so been I, done? I, that's a very good question. I honestly, I, I don't know. Um, I bet you it's not been looked into because we don't have well, full access to, to human blood. And I think 
especially here in this country, I think it would be almost frowned upon. You know, sometimes we are giving immunoglobulins to dogs that have IMHA, so IVIG, and it is very difficult to source from the human hospitals now because it is needed for humans. Mm. Um, but I assume that it would be similar, um, that cats won't have antibodies to the human blood, and therefore they would it would have a delayed hemolytic transfusion reaction uh, but I guess as vets, our source is going to be canine blood, which is very easy for us to source and very easy to collect. Um, but yeah, I don't foresee that becoming something in the future. Yeah, pro- uh, in the, the ethics around yeah. the lo- dog um, xenotransfusion is probably, uh, it's, it's better to probably stick with that. Um, <laughs> you mentioned oxyglobin as well. Yeah. Um, and I was speaking to a colleague at VVS and apparently, and I don't know if you've heard Jack? similar well there's a company in new zealand i think or or australia that's looking at producing it again so it may may come back on the market Yeah, that would be great i mean i think it's great uh i used it quite a bit when i was a resident i mean it's been many years that it hasn't been available and again it was licensed in the dog but not in the cat but we could use it in cats and i mean the risks to the patient was very low i mean the risks of the xenotransfusion i mean five years ago everyone even the blood bank everyone they were saying don't do it don't do it and now i think the more we do it we see that's not that big of a deal um but why set them up for a delayed transfusion reaction or where they could have a reaction and the the hemo the oxyglobin seemed really useful so that would be great i'll have to look into it yeah well uh, fingers crossed Um, and that's all of the questions Uh, there is a comment um from marta marta thank you for your comment just to let you know we are a vet to vet referral service so we don't take um any referrals directly from owners so if you do speak to your primary vet um and ask them to come and have a look at our website www.vvs.vet would be really welcome to speak to them um and discuss the case but i'm afraid we don't um do any any consultations directly with owners but thank you for your time and for for joining us so thank you everyone else for coming along um and thank you jess for another really really great presentation we've got three more webinars with jess friday lunchtime webinars uh 1 p.m for the next three free fridays um so the next one is cobalamin disorders in the dog and cat that's on the 27th of october at 1 p.m we've also got proteinuria on the 3rd of november at 1 p.m and then our final one um is the subclinical bacteria and urinary tract infections on the 10th of november at 1 p.m so do hope you can join us for those as well um we will be sharing the the registration links and otherwise thank you so much enjoy the rest of your day and i hope everyone has a wonderful weekend thank you thanks all bye